Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, at CC, hello and welcome, at one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, <laughs> there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 12, and it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Through the life of this podcast, whether it be through my conversations with other documentary industry people or through episodes strictly hosted by myself, I'm often either talking about or at least making reference to the documentary and commercial work that I do overseas. Because of this, over the past month or so, I've been receiving some emails requesting that I maybe dedicate a whole show to a discussion about doing doc work abroad. So I thought that what we delve into today was a bit of a primer for those of you thinking about shooting your work overseas. Now, Much of this discussion will probably center around shooting in developing countries, since a lot of my doc work has tended to take place in these environments. But much of this will be applicable to any countries globally. I'm going to break this discussion up into three different sections. And just for the fun of it, why don't we refer to these three sections in the way we would, you know, phases of film production, like pre-production, production, production, post-production. I hope this doesn't confuse any listeners who may be jumping into this podcast midstream, but I'll try and remind everyone as we start a new section. So let us begin with pre-production. So the pre-production, if you will, is basically going to be your trip preparation. This is a fairly simple list of things to remember to do, bring, or think about before you embark on your filmmaking journey to a faraway land. In 2004, I took my first real job working on a documentary film overseas. It was on the award-winning Fulbright and State Department financed film, Bomb Hunters. I've referred to this doc a number of times before. It's the one that really first set me on my documentary life course. It took me to the country of Cambodia, a place that has since become sort of my home away from home. And it's the film that turned my heart and mind to the documentary genre. I was the sound person on the film and then afterwards was hired as the editor. The film's gone on to win a number of festival awards. It's played PBS here in the States for quite a while, or it did. I don't know if it still is. And its subject matter, the harvesting for profit of old bombs and mortars that lay in the soil decades after war. It's since played a part in changing some U.S. government legislature on the usage of cluster bombs um, during wartime. Now, when I left for Cambodia... I truly had no idea what I was getting myself into or what I was doing really other than holding a boom microphone and mixing sound. I mean, I was completely clueless about the country I was going to, much less how to best sort of prep for such an adventure. Now, the director that I was working with who had hired me, he'd spent some time working in Cambodia prior to this, a few years prior to this, on another um, a narrative film, I believe. And so he was able to provide some insight and help. But other than that and, you know, the trusty old lonely planet, 
uh, I really was embarking on a journey without any sort of life map. So what I'm about to tell you will hopefully help you prepare for your filmmaking trip and avoid any future potentially costly mistakes. So one of the first things that I would highly recommend before embarking on your documentary journey overseas is to try to learn some of the language. It's easy to kind of go into a place and get immersed in your work, surround yourself. Maybe you've brought your some of your own crew and your own people with you. And so it's it's easy to be using, easy to be communicating in English or, or your own language. And but it's important to remember that, and you'll see this later on when we get into production, that learning, I, I can't encourage enough to learn some of the language before you go. And really, it's as simple as things as hello, how are you, how much is that, just some really cursory language. If you can arm yourself with that before you go, it's going to pay off in, in dividends, and it's going to create an experience that's far more reaching than you had really imagined. Again, we'll get into this a little bit later on. But do yourself a favor, buy a book or some tapes, I guess CDs or MP3s, that are going to start to arm you with usage of the language. Of course, your you know, pronunciation is gonna, and your dialect is going to be completely um, different um, learning from a book or learning from a CD than it is when you're actually um, in country, but it's going to go a long way before you get there if you can start working on that. Passports and visas, obviously these are a biggie. What I would recommend, the best thing that you can do is learn about before you go into your country or you, or the host country, if you will, learn about what the passport and visa requirements are for that country. It, it's it's often different in 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 all countries, even countries that might be um, in a particular region. Like for, for me, a lot of the work that I've done in Southeast Asia, well, visa requirements are different in Cambodia than they are, say, in Nepal, than they are in Indonesia or Malaysia. And it's good to arm yourself with that knowledge beforehand because even something as basic, okay, I'll give you an example, something as basic as this. And I, I was fortunate enough to know before my first trip to Southeast Asia that, that it would be good to have on hand not only copies, photocopies of your passport, but passport sized photos. Because what will happen is oftentimes um, in developing countries in particular, when you get off the plane and you get in line to get your passport book stamped and to get maybe your tourist visa or maybe even business visas, which we'll get into in a minute here, uh, they're going to ask you for a passport sized photo. And if you have one on you, first of all, it's probably going to surprise them. And secondly, they're going to know that you know what you're doing or they're going to have some inclination that you do. Um, that's a good thing later on because you don't find yourself immersed in in some of these developing countries, um, government officials. Unfortunately, the truth is that sometimes, let's say they're amenable to a little bakshish, if you will, which is a little bit of extra money. And they will try to um, sometimes, de depending on the country, depending on the government officials, um, there is bribery that happens. If you already have your passport size photo, you won't run into that in terms of um, they might try to get a, uh, well, first of all, you're going to have to have a passport size photo. So they might move you to the back of the line or they might move you to a different line where you have to get your photo taken. And suddenly you're paying $20 for two copies of a passport size photo. Whereas back home, maybe you paid, you know, 10, $15 and you got a handful of photos or do it, do it. I've done many, many times. And it's so simple is have someone take a photo of you that is, and get the dimensions, you know, just Google this, go online, get the dimensions of a proper passport size photo, have someone take that photo against a white background, and then duplicate that, you know, on a large page in Photoshop. And, and you suddenly you have 20 passport size photos. I'm always carrying anywhere from five to 10 photos on me. And it saved me um, hassle and a lot of money over the years. So Highly recommend the passport size photos doing that uh, prior to prior to your travels. And again, arm yourself with knowledge about what visa and passport requirements are. Even recently, I made a mistake where I had done some work in Cambodia and I tried to go on a, I wanted to go on a business visa, which would have allowed, it, allowed me to stay 
uh, six months without having to leave the country and then reapply for um, a tourist or a business visa. I made the mistake of when I got off the plane, I asked for a tourist visa, which was 30 days, assuming that I could then go to the government office and apply for my business visa afterwards. I won't get into the hassle that ensued or even because I don't understand really what happened uh, in terms of legally, but I was unable to get my business visa at the government offices in Cambodia after I'd already received my tourist visa. So I was, I had to leave the country. I literally flew to Malaysia, flew into the airport, didn't even leave the Malaysian airport in KL, got back on a flight and headed back into Cambodia just so I could leave the country officially, come back in, and then I was able to get my new visa. Now, if, if initially I'd gotten off the plane and I knew this, if I had known this prior, all I had to do was pay an extra $20 and request a business visa, and I would have been stamped right there for six months. I wouldn't have had to leave the country and come back in, pay money to do this, and yeah, blah, blah, blah. You, you get my point here. The more knowledge you can prep yourself with prior to um, going to a country about passports and visas, the better off you're going to be. And a lot of that is simple as going on message boards online. Find out people who are traveling to those and working into those countries. Immunizations, anti-malarial, and other drugs. Immunizations are a big one. You want to know what are the, basically what are the immunizations you're going to want to have prior to going to a country. Now, I've learned over the years, in particular going into developing countries like Haiti or Nepal and Cambodia, there tend to be some similar immunizations that you just have to have in to work in those countries. They may seem like no-brainers, but if you haven't done your research and then you go to the country and you haven't gotten this immunization, it can be a little bit problematic uh, if you were to say, I don't know, a step on a rusty nail and you haven't had your tetanus shot done in the last 10 years. Um, you also want your hepatitis A and B. You, it's good to get your typhoid shots. Um, again, every country is different. There are some similarities, but every country also has their own set of circumstances and disease may be more abundant in some other countries than others. And so again, do your research there. Find out what the immunizations are that you'll need prior to going. Now here, I'm going to throw this one out here. Here's an interesting one. And I was talking to a friend recently who's going to Thailand for the first time. And I recommended to him, wait until you get to Thailand and go to one of the Bangkok hospitals and get your immunizations there. I know that seems like an iffy, scary sort of thought, but it will save you a ton of money, at least if you're coming from the U.S. Immunizations, travel immunizations, you have to go to special travel clinics here in the U.S. And it gets expensive very, very quickly. And... I saved literally a couple hundred dollars the last time I did work in Cambodia because I knew that the immunizations that I needed to have were the same exact quality, same exact pharmaceutical companies that were here in the U.S., and I literally saved a couple of hundred dollars. So you again can do your research there. Simply Google what are the travel clinics in these other countries, maybe the country that you're going to, find out what those what those clinics are, find out if they have immunizations there, and take advantage of that, seriously. Working in countries where malaria is prevalent, which is a, a lot of these countries that are I've already mentioned, that's a tricky one in everybody's approach is a little bit different. Some people swear by taking anti-malarial drugs, Others kind of go in and, and do the precautions that they can, i.e. mosquito nets, i.e. anti-mosquito spray, things of that nature. Initially, when I went to um, Southeast Asia back in 2004, I brought ant some anti-malarial drugs with me. Um, that they, they were based in uh, what's known as quinine is the component that was in this anti-malarial drug. Quinine is a component of a lot of the, these anti-malarial drugs, or it has been in the past, that works with drugs like doxycycline, tetracycline, or clindamycin. And, you know, I, I even actually can't remember the exact name of the drug that I had taken that had quinine in it. Um, I don't remember the pharmaceutical name of it, but I took it with me, and I started taking it just before I left for Cambodia. 
And I was well aware that side effects were things like rashes, vertigo, and nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, even more serious sort of neurological effects um, due to sort of the neurotoxic properties that are latent within these drugs. And it, it, things like renal failure, um, psychosis were obviously on the more extreme end. But these were, this drug was recommended for me if I was working in, in, heavily mosquito malaria infested environments and and certainly right after as particular right after monsoon season which is when we landed in Cambodia the first time it was it was prevalent and we were going to be working in provinces where it, it was it was there and so I started taking this drug and I realized about a couple weeks in I definitely experienced some of the rashes definitely experienced some nausea and then was having horrific nightmares to the point where I just didn't feel comfortable taking the drug any longer. And I decided to, you know, wear the appropriate clothing, use mosquito nets where I needed to and use, you know, bug spray, where, you know, to be honest. And I've been using that ever since 2004, that sort of approach to it. And I've never I've never had an issue. It's up to you. I mean, there and there are much easier drugs now that you can take that are much easier on the system, like the aforementioned doxycycline. But um, I guess I guess it's you know, like I said, it's it's a personal preference, and for me, I chose not to do so. Another thing that I want to recommend that you do prior to going overseas and doing your work is to pack light. And I know that everybody says that it's a general rule of thumb if you're trekking, it's a general rule of thumb if you're hiking and camping. But but it's it's even more so important here because you have to keep your eye on all of your personals and all of your gear and your equipment. And it's easier to do that if you have those, I guess, you know, together in one, two, or three bags, if you will. The more bags you have, the more you have to, it just gives you anxiety. Even when you're riding on, you know, bus rides within countries and you're, and you're throwing your packs and your gear and equipment below you, or, you know, if you can, maybe you buy a seat next to you and and carry your gear next to you. But, but, but often it's just, it's just, yeah, it just can save you anxiety. If you know that you've packed light, A, a, a real easy way that you can do that is often I have found people bring way more clothing than they need. So what you can do about that is literally take half the clothing that you need, knowing that you can buy the clothing that you need for super, super cheap in the country that you're going to. Um, That works a couple of different ways. You're packing light and you're also kind of, you're also acclimating to your surroundings and your environment because you're going to be wearing clothing that other people maybe are a little bit more used to seeing. So, uh, yeah, honestly, it's super cheap. It's a great idea. Buy your clothing um, in the country that you're going to, and that's going to help you. It's going to help you move lightly. Now, the last thing I want to mention um, that I think is really important for you prior to doing your film work overseas is to have some sort of backup system. And generally, that means a backup camera. I know it's easier said than done. Often we're working with budget constraints that maybe don't necessarily lend easily to a full on backup system. But honestly, guys, have a backup camera. And it doesn't it doesn't have to be the exact camera that you have that you're working with as your main camera. I mean, you know, I I, I currently, you know, Steph and I currently own the Canon C three hundred Mark II it's not appropriate to spend another 16 grand to have another Canon C300 Mark II for us right now. But we do have, you know, a couple of DSLRs that we can take. We've got a 5D and a 7D that we can use. Those are legitimate backups. If worse comes to worse and your camera goes down, you, you at least have something. And any of, any of my listeners who have seen my Nepal documentary, Journey to Kathmandu, and read any of the information behind it, seen the behind scenes. There is a behind scenes footage where basically it's, I'm, I've only been in country for about a week and I've just started filming and the camera went down on, on like literally the first, second or third day of shooting on the film. I hadn't even gotten out to the Himalayas yet. I hadn't even gotten out to the mountains yet where the majority of filming happens. And back in 2009, 
HD cameras are not a thing to find in in Kathmandu or anywhere in Nepal for that matter. So I was, yeah, I was freaking out for a couple of days. And I was very extremely lucky to, lucky to find a local filmmaker who had another camera, an HDV camera, a tape-based camera that was pretty damn close to the the one I was using at the time, which was a, a Sony V1U. And he, he had the Sony Z1U for any of you camera geeks out there. You, you need a backup. You just have to because if you spend all this time and money and energy just getting to the country to do your dock and your camera goes down and guess what it probably will it happens it's just the nature of the environments you're working in there's a lot of dirt dust water um, a lot of jostling around a lot of travel happens wear and tear it's just bound it can happen and it's bound to happen and and you know how it works especially if you don't have a backup so do yourself a favor have some sort of a backup if you'd like to see a little behind the scenes piece about the moment where my camera goes down during the making of Journey to Kathmandu. Um, it's either included, you can find it included as the extras, as bonus sort of DVD selections, if you will. If you go to journeytokathmandu.com, the film website, and watch the film, included in that is a number of behind the scenes moments, including this moment where the camera goes down during my first week. You can also find that just by going to YouTube. It's just a two minute video. If you go to YouTube and search making of Journey to Kathmandu, camera goes down, you'll be able to find it there as well. It's kind of a, it's an, it's a moment that I can share with you where you, you can get an idea what it feels like to be, you know, having, having had all of your resources and sort of your passion project ready to go. And just as you, just as you've gotten to the country and start to film, bam, the camera goes down. So check that out if you, if you have a moment. After I premiered my first documentary film, Journey to Kathmandu, a film that took nearly five years to make, I remember feeling elated and exhausted. Is there any other feeling like the first time you show your completed doc film to an audience? I don't think there is. Not long after, I took a well-deserved short break away from the city, and it was while I was on a hike, when I had reached a mountaintop and was overlooking the Great Columbia River, that I found myself thinking back on the film and the journey that I'd been on. I thought about all the mistakes I'd made, all the wins that I'd had, how it had felt to finally share my film with an audience, and I thought about the life it would have from here on out. And I began to break down all the components of what had gotten me to where I was at that moment, and all the things I wished I'd done differently. And this is how I began to form what I am sharing with you today, a free course entitled The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist. In the Essential Checklist, I share with you the fundamental aspects of making a documentary film, and perhaps most importantly, help you to avoid making some of the mistakes that I made during my first feature film. It is my sincere hope that The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist will help make your doc film's journey the truly exhilarating experience that it can and should be. It's yours simply by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses and enrolling for free. Moving on to sort of the second area that I want to talk to you about when doing your film work overseas. This is what we're kind of making analogous to the production phase, right? So actually doing the filming. One of the first things that I'm going to recommend you do as you set out to do filming in, in the country that you're going to be filming in is... Get yourself a proper translator slash fixer. And some people will separate this, right? They'll have a translator maybe during for interviews, and then they'll have a fixer who is kind of sort of working with you um, and, and as you as you go from town to town or province to province doing your work. And they sort of, you know, they're helping you facilitate what you need to do work-wise in the area where you're going to work with. So they're going to be working with, say, maybe the chief of the commune and, and, and yourself. And they're kind of facilitating what the needs are for the film versus what they can, what, what say, the, the community that you're going to be operating with, what they can and can, can do to help you. I, I like my translator fixer to be one and the same person. So that's how I'll refer to them here. But you may separate them. I can't stress enough what the translator fixer does for your film. For example, I've been working with the same translator fixer 
in Cambodia since 2004 when I first met him on Bomb Hunters. I've used him for subsequent projects, um, both commercial and documentary, and he's become a very dear friend. His name is Pun Kaisika. Anybody that knows me probably knows Kaisika. And if I remember, maybe I'll put a picture of Kaisika up on up on the uh, up on the Documentary Life website. Just a wonderful family man and absolutely eager to help out with the film. He's someone who, from the get-go, really understood, without even having worked in film prior to this, he, he inherently seemed to understand what our needs were. And it was a really unique combination of, um, he was excited to be working with us, he was excited to share his culture with with us, which, as you can imagine, was massive when working in, you know, when, when doing film work in another culture. Having someone give you some context to where you are and what it means to be doing the work where you are. And somebody like Kaizuka is is absolutely invaluable they end up really helping you as a as a as a as a producer really in that country because what they do in terms of opening avenues that you never could have done yourself the importance of that cannot be stated enough here so finding yourself a translator slash fixer is of ultra ultra importance for your production and there are there are different ways to do that again you can get on the internet and you can find fixers and translators that work in the country where you're going to be working in or maybe even better yet try to find somebody who's done documentary film work in those countries and see who they recommend recommendations can go a long way I'd also like to stress the importance of a good driver. You're going to need someone to take you from point A to point B in efficient ways. Yes, you can take buses, and you will have to take buses at times. You can take, you know, tuk-tuks from town to town. Anybody who's done work in Southeast Asia knows about the about the uh, the importance of a good tuk-tuk and what a tuk-tuk is. Again, maybe I'll put a picture of that up online. You want to find a reliable driver. And that driver may or may not be able to speak a little bit of English. If they can, that's a bonus. If they can't, you at least you have your translator fixer with you. But find someone who you can negotiate prices with prior to your traveling. And then they use those similar prices. And they also understand, not unlike the translator fixer, they start to get what you're trying to do. And so a good driver will not only get you from point A to point B efficiently, but oftentimes they can get you to places that other people may not be able to get you to or may be hesitant to get you to. I'm not I'm not suggesting that you put anyone's lives in danger, but you'll start to learn to use your judgment as to where you want to be and what's safe and what isn't. Your fixer is going to help you decide, make these decisions, and your driver will as well. And you'll be surprised. Um, I've had some amazing drivers over the years who have gotten me to areas that I, I just didn't think that we we're going to be able to get to and that ended up being critical for filming. Now, this kind of goes alongside with the next the next component to all this in, in production overseas, and that's working with local crew. Part of what I love about doing documentary and commercial work overseas is working with the local crew. I'll probably take, what I'll do is often, Steph and I will take one or two key members. We might take our DP, or if you're from the UK or Europe, it's referred to, of course, as the DOP. We might take a sound person. But other than that, we like to hire local crew. It helps us immerse ourselves more in the culture. It allows us to really get a greater understanding of what the people are like that we're going to be filming. And it's just a joy working with, I mean, I love it. I love working with and meeting new people and and learning about what their culture and customs are. And and working with crews, man, let me tell you, it really runs the gamut um, in terms of I've worked with crews in Cambodia. I've worked with crews in Malaysia. I've worked with crews in uh, in China. And they all are different and they operate differently. And it's definitely a game um, learning how people work. It's, it's like anywhere else. And it's usually a really, really rewarding experience. There are moments where you have, where you may have some issues and, and hopefully you've got a translator or fixer that can help you work through that because that's an important thing too. You don't want to be hurting people's feelings. You don't want to be 
you know, ruffling any cultural feathers, if you will. So it's important to um, be obviously, if you're in sticky situations where maybe you need to let someone go or hire somebody else who maybe is more equipped to do what you need to do, you know, you want to find the best way to do that. And, and that's where your translator fixer again will come in. Practice your language often. And again, all of these kind of work together using your translator fixer, um, working with your driver, working with local crew. I said earlier, start to learn some of the language. Well, here's where you start to practice it. And I can't tell you how much it means to people when you approach them with a smile and you greet them in their tongue. So many times we see, so many times I've seen when I work overseas, typical tourists who, you know, they get off their, they go from point A to point B on their air conditioned buses, go to the touristy spots in Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam. And they actually rarely, they almost rarely have contact with the countries and the people and the culture that they're actually visiting. And they almost, they have, they end up having this sort of westernized version, this watered down version of, of what their trip could be. And I would say should have been. And language is a part of that. Don't go to a country and think that you can just use English. That's not only not going to help you, but it can hinder you. It's just that using language opens people up. And I have found when I do work and use even really basic hellos and thank yous and how are yous, it, it, it puts a smile on people's faces and they open up in a way that they wouldn't to a normal tourist because they're so used to seeing Westerners who, who, who sort of talk at them or who want something from them. And of course, don't even use the language. They just use their own, like say French or English or German. And and it, it just, it's really, I find people are very appreciative when you approach them and show a willingness to learn their culture and their language is a big part of that. Which lends to the next part of, 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 of my recommendations, which is be respective of cultural mores. Again, do your research, do your due diligence prior to going to these to these areas that you're going to be working in and find out things like what are the appropriate clothing to wear? You know, don't go to a place of worship wearing a tank top and shorts. Don't place your hands on monks. In many Southeast Asian countries, don't touch people's heads. It's very offensive. Or raise your feet above, really, feet level. Take off your shoes in all houses. You know, people eat off of floors. They sleep on their floors. Keep your political views to yourself. Don't be Donald Trump when you go into these countries. <laughs> um, maybe I should edit that out. I don't know. I'll decide later, right? Um, but you get you get what I'm trying to say. Just be respectful of culture when you go into these places to work. Ask permission to shoot. Don't just run and gun your way into a situation um, when you're doing your documentary. I, I get it, um, but but it, it's 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 a smarter and more. I, I'm I'm telling you, if you don't take the Michael Moore approach, <laughs> you're probably going to get a lot further along when you're doing documentary work in these countries. Um, be respectful in the way that you ask them if you can take a photograph. It takes two seconds, you know. Ask them if you can take their photo. Ask them if you can roll a video. Um, and you know, for a lot of you listeners out there who you, who are operating with DSLRs, yeah, that's a big advantage of using a DSLR in these communities is that they may not, in some of the rural areas, they're probably not used to seeing a camera operating as video. And so you can be rolling video and, you know, they think that you're, you know, taking photos. And I'm not saying, you know, take advantage of that, but I'm saying it can ease the process. Any sort of film work, when you come in with a bunch of film gear into an area, you are raising awareness. And people, you can't hide your camera. You can't hide your boom mic. So anything you can do to minimize that impact is going to go a long way. <laughs> Moving on to our third and final section in this podcast again this is sort of an analogy to the three phases of filmmaking so this is this is really after your trip when you come back home 
there are a couple of things that you can do to help yourself when you come back home that, you know, I had to learn sort of the hard way and or learn through experience. And I can share some of these ideas with you. And hopefully it's going to help um, relieve some of the impact that you might feel coming back home, especially if you've done extensive work in developing countries for an extended a period of time. The first thing I'd say is it's kind of a no brainer rest well especially if you're doing work in another part of the country where you know you're you're operating in a completely different time zone your body is going to be worked not only from having done say weeks or months of documentary work in these environments it's also going to be worked through the big time change that you're making coming back into country and so resting properly and resting well feeding well hydration is going to go a long way in helping your body sort of acclimate back into your surroundings and i'd recommend not really planning anything for at least a few days preferably a week afterwards your body just needs time to it needs time to acclimate and i've made this mistake you know Unfortunately, I've made this mistake more times than I'd like to admit. Years ago, when I was first doing work overseas, I remember a trip that I had taken to, I think this was a pre-trip to Nepal, and I came back and I took a job literally, you know, I flew in on one day and, and the next day had to get up to work. I was working uh, as an art PA on a job, and so... I needed money. I needed the work. I'd been working in Nepal for six weeks. And literally the day after I got back, I took on a job for a couple of days. And sure enough, I got super sick. I was worn down. I was tired. Um, I was working and operating in an absolute haze. And that day, um, later in the afternoon, I ended up, I was driving a one ton vehicle and sure enough, I ended up in a bit of an accident and you can imagine how humiliating that is. And when you're working as a PA or as a production assistant, regardless of department, you, you just don't want to make those kinds of mistakes. Those people aren't going to hire you again, whether it's, you know, no matter whose fault it is. And, and of course I take all blame for that. I, the truth is I just, I shouldn't have accepted that job. And, and I did. I came back after uh, an ex- a period of time working in Nepal. And the next day I tried doing a job and, and sure enough ran into some, well, I'll say I ran into some trouble. <laughs> Talk to family and friends when you get back, but don't overwhelm them. And I, and I say that because you're going, especially if you're operating in developing countries, you're going to be seeing, witnessing, taking part in things that most of our family and friends not only have uh, never experienced, but maybe they've never seen before. And expecting them to understand what you've gone through, it's it's a difficult thing. And I can speak from experience when I first got back from that from that initial trip to Cambodia, spending six months, you know, around bombs and mortars and rockets and villagers who were digging them up, and often seeing. Um, the carnage and havoc that that occurred through this practice. I saw some pretty pretty tough things and and rough things, and it was a hard six months. And coming back into the U.S. and then um, and then and then editing afterwards during that time, it took me quite a while to decompress afterwards. And um, you know, you can ask some of my family members. I was and friends. It, I was tough to be around. Uh, I I went into a depression afterwards. It was, uh, I had, I felt like what I had experienced had changed me forever, but I didn't really know how it was going to change me at that time. It felt I was armed with this knowledge that I wanted everyone to know about. I wanted everyone to know about what I thought were the wrongs of, say, U.S. administration during the Vietnam War. Um, and, and, and I wanted people to know about it, and I overwhelmed people. I overwhelmed myself. I was sad for months. I wasn't a very social person. And so, I guess what I'm saying is when you work in these types of environments and you work in these situations, talk to your family and friends, open up to them, but don't overwhelm them and don't expect them to to know what you're experiencing, Um, but don't hide from it either. You know, don't hide from it. Uh, and, and, and something that can help, and it's sort of the last item on this in this area, is take some time with your footage and photographs. Write about your experiences. 
You know, when we did Bomb Hunters in 2004, I was fortunate enough to be hired to edit it. And and I really immediately immersed myself in that footage for the next four months cutting this. And so in some ways, it almost felt like I hadn't left Cambodia because, you know, I'm pulling 12 to 14 hour days, six days a week down in a basement, a dark basement. And I'm looking at all the footage and photographs that we had shot and seeing all the people that I had been been working with and experiencing and filming. And so in some ways it helped ease my transition back into country because it wasn't it wasn't like going from one culture to another coming back to the US from Cambodia was equally in a way if not even more of a culture shock for me if you can if you can picture or imagine that and so having this footage and photographs to immerse myself into was very helpful it eased that transition Okay, everybody, and that's it. There you have it, the pre-production, production, production, and post-production of recommendations, if you will, for doing documentary work overseas. One thing that I'd like to mention is, you know what? I'd love to hear some of your stories and recommendations that you might have for anybody that's worked overseas doing documentary work. It'd be awesome to share that with the rest of our of our community. So again, send an email or go to the website. The website is documentarylife.com. You can drop me a line there or you can email me directly at chris at barongfilms.com. It'd be great to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear about your experiences and your recommendations and maybe share them with the community as well. Thanks, everybody. And I'll see you again in two weeks' time. Don't forget, if you're interested in a guide to help you navigate the fundamental aspects of doc filmmaking, the things that every doc filmmaker should know, then get our free doc filmmaking course, The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.